Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, Healthcare IT Security, Implementing Best Practices and Controls Using the High Trust DSS. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Moss Adams is pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize here both how you view our presentation mind. and you how you interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. For example, you can click the file folder icon to download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by clicking Q&A in the bottom left-hand portion of the icon bar and typing in your question. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. We'll ask polling questions throughout today's presentation. Per the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy Webcast CPE Standards, CPE credit will be awarded based on your participation in these polls. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. If you're attending this webcast in a group, in order to receive CPE credit, you must complete our attendance sheet available in the file folder icon at the bottom of your screen. Please have all group members sign the sheet and please remit only one sheet per group. Also note, today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and is not available to participants who view the on-demand version. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon to open a PDF file you can save to your computer. We'll email a copy of your PDF certificate in two weeks if you can't download it today. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. Good morning and welcome everyone. I'm happy to introduce today's Moss Adams presenters, Kevin Villanueva, Director, and Troy Hawes, Senior Manager. Kevin has been in the information technology field since 1997 and leads the firm's IT infrastructure and security practice. He specializes in government, not-for-profit, private entity, higher education, and healthcare clients. His areas of practice include IT security assessments, penetration testing, PCI DSS assessments, HIPAA compliance auditing, high trust readiness and validation assessments, strategic technology planning, disaster recovery and business continuity planning, policies, procedures, and documentation development, and project management. Troy has been providing IT consulting services since 2001. He serves clients in a variety of industries, including government entities, communications and media organizations, various critical infrastructure sectors, healthcare organizations, publicly traded entities, private businesses, and higher education institutions. He has extensive experience managing and leading IT security audits and assessments, social engineering campaigns, and penetration testing, PCI DSS audits, HIPAA security and privacy assessments, disaster recovery planning, alternatives analysis, network design and implementation, IT co-sourcing, and SOC audits. Kevin, I will now turn the line over to you to get us started. Excellent. Thanks, Emily, and uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us on this webcast this morning. Um, I thought I'd go over just a kind of our brief agenda here. We have roughly about uh, 25 or so slides to go through, uh, but I thought I'd start off with uh, kind of doing a year in review for 2016. It was, uh, if you can recall, it was a, a banner year for uh, cyber attacks uh, throughout all industries, uh, healthcare included. Um, and so I thought I'd, I'd kind of set the stage with that. Um, then we'll go into talking about some of these threat vectors or, or really kind of what are the attack points uh, that an attacker or, or a malicious individual would, would uh, uh, get to you as far as um, uh, exploiting uh, data that's being held by healthcare entities. Uh, and then I'll transition over to Troy, where he's going to really kind of cover uh, what is the difference between high trust versus HIPAA, uh, in particular the HIPAA security rule. 
Um, you know, High Trust is a relatively new uh, best practice framework for cybersecurity related to uh, healthcare covered entities and business associates. So I think it's important to, to understand um, kind of the details behind High Trust, and you know, Troy will cover that uh, in, in greater detail later in this uh, presentation. And then we'll close it off with talking about some of the cybersecurity best practices and those that kind of map over uh, with the High Trust framework and kind of what you guys can be thinking about as you're looking at bolstering your cybersecurity posture in your own in your own environments. So here we, we're going to start off with uh, the first polling question. I'll turn it back over to you, Emily. All right, thank you. And our first question is, is your organization currently High Trust CSF certified or thinking about certification? Your options are yes, no, or I don't know. And I'll give everyone a few minutes to make a few moments to make a selection. To participate, please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. And take a look at the results. Kevin, back to you. Okay, so uh, just kind of a, what we expected. Uh, certainly, uh, given the newness of the high trust certification for uh, covered entities and business associates, uh, it, it, I would have expected to see uh, even a higher percentage of I don't know responses out there. But uh, it, it's good that you're on this webcast to learn a little bit more. So thank you. So let's talk about kind of the 2016 and the year in review here. Um, so we did a little bit of research and, and uh, looked at this particular study by the Identity Theft Resource Center, and they did a study back in 2016 where they uh, they looked at essentially the number of data breaches that were reported. So in that study, they found that you know there was a 40% increase in in data breaches that were actually reported uh, over 2015. Now what we're talking about there is really the ones that were actually reported uh, publicly uh, as a data breach versus those that um, may not have been reported. So I imagine that that number is actually probably a lot higher than 1,093 as far as what was covered in the study. Um, the, so the breaches, actually, they, they uh, covered roughly um, 36.7 million records, which is actually lower than the previous year. And if you think about 2015 with the, uh, the attacks against Anthem and Primera, uh, that's, that's kind of not surprising because uh, just between those those two attacks alone back in 2015, it really eclipsed uh, the number uh, total for uh, 2016, rather. Um, particular cyber attacks on healthcare, they grew by 63% uh, back in, uh, in 2016. So that's roughly 377 incidents of the 1,093 that were actually reported. Um, so it's actually growing as far as the number uh, of healthcare-related attacks. Um, further in that study, they essentially noted that um, roughly most of the attacks were on the commercial business entities. So this included retails, uh, retail entities as well. Healthcare came in kind of a distant second, but it's still a prominent number with roughly uh, 300, again, that 377 in incidents that were actually reported uh, that covered roughly 16.4 million records that were actually um, uh, compromise in 2016 in total for healthcare. So quite a big number uh, in spite of being eclipsed back in 2015. Uh, healthcare was followed by education and then lastly, uh, government and military uh, followed. Um, so from the study, we, we found that, you know, that, that it was concluded that these cyber attacks are increasingly more sophisticated, uh, more complex, and yet criminals are still relying on some of these older techniques such as phishing, email phishing attacks, and just you know, regular hacking attacks against like things like web servers, or, or firewalls, or other attack vectors along uh, an organization's network perimeter. So they found that essentially 55% of all those reported breaches last year um, were actually a, as a result of hacking, uh, payment card skimming, and phishing attacks, uh, which you know represented the, the leading cause of data loss for the for the last uh, eight for the eighth year in a row. So. Really, those three techniques or, um, or, or approaches to uh, stealing data, those are, are still more common even, even today. Um, and even as you know, attacks become more complex and, and more, uh, more prevalent over time. Uh, and, and as a result, this represented an 18% increase over uh, 2015. 
So if you look at this, this chart here, most of the attacks, as you can see, were against healthcare providers. Uh, in second place came, you know, health plans at, at 52 attacks. And then business, business associates were only about 20, 20 of the attacks that were reported. And this kind of stayed steady uh, compared to the 2015 numbers. Now, I believe that this number for uh, attacks against business associates will actually increase. And I think it's going to be as a result of a lot of these covered entities uh, are using uh, cloud-based services now or moving toward cloud-based services. And a lot of these cloud-based services that handle protected health information on a, a covered entity's behalf, they may not have as sophisticated or as mature controls in place for protecting PHI or, or EPHI in this case. And so as a result, you're, you're probably going to see attackers looking at these cloud-based services as probably low-hanging fruit um, um, to essentially try to uh, attack and exploit vulnerabilities uh, in, in their environments where they can actually uh, get access to protected health information. Um, and, and so I, I imagine that we're going to see a lot more attacks against business associates, especially those that are, are cloud-based or, um, you know, those hosting providers that handle uh, PHI on the covered entity's behalf. So why, why the surge here? Well, you know, if you look at the data that's out there and really what's contained in a medical record, the medical record itself is actually the holy grail of, of uh, stolen data for attackers. Uh, and in fact, uh, this year, the, 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 the uh, cost of a medical record on the dark web where they actually market and sell this information actually went up by 10 bucks. Uh, in 2015, medical records were essentially going for roughly $50 in, in or excuse me, in 2016 rather, but now this year uh, we did some research and it's actually up to about $60, $60 for a medical record. Um, credit card account numbers, those kind of stayed steady at like 50 cents to $30 depending on the level of information that's provided with the credit card. Um, and then, you know, social security numbers, those stayed pretty steady at roughly uh, 12 to $15 for a social security number. Now, why, why are medical records uh, so attractive for an attacker? Uh, well, it, it's pretty simple. I mean, medical records are a longer term play than credit cards. If an individual loses their credit card or it gets stolen or that credit card number gets compromised in some way, then, you know, it's as simple as calling up the, the issuer, the bank, and saying, you know, hey, my credit card was stolen, release me a new, uh, a new card with a new account number. And that's it. In a lot of cases, uh, the bank or the issuer will actually reimburse any fraudulent charges on your credit card. And so it's not so, um, so uh, uh, such a viable attack target for, an, uh, for a malicious individual because, you know, that window of opportunity for using a credit card is so small. Well, with medical records, if you think about what's included there, and it's just a treasure trove of information for an attacker, there's you know, social security number that would be on there, employment information, sometimes bank information, all your other demographic inf information that makes up a medical record, you know, that's really gold for an attacker. And they can use that information to make fake IDs, obtain, uh, you know, uh, drugs for resale, uh, insurance claim fraud, and even tax fraud uh, can be used with that data from a medical record. And a medical record itself, it's it's a longer term play because, you know, you're not automatically informed like a credit card uh, that your medical information is getting misused in somehow, uh, in some manner. And so, you know, it may be months, maybe even years before you know that your, your information has been compromised that, uh, due to a, a theft of a medical record. And so that's why it makes it such an attractive target for these attackers is because, you know, it's a longer term play. They could use that information on a longer term basis than just stealing a credit card number or a social security number. So what we have here is if you look at 2016, I mean, we just saw just so many attacks against the healthcare industry. And I mean, the, the, the news headlines just start stacking up. And so, um, I mean, it was a banner year and it's going to continue to be a banner year in 2017 um, as like some of these evolving threat vectors just become more prevalent. Um, I mean, if we look back, at 2016, 2016 was known amongst cybersecurity circles as the year of ransomware. And, you know, as you can only look back at what happened to uh, Hollywood Presbyterian last, last February in 2016 uh, when they were subject to a ransomware attack that resulted in them having to, to pay up something like uh, roughly $17,500 uh, 
uh, dollars uh, just to get their EMR system uh, freed up from the ransomware. Uh, and so it's a real threat for healthcare entities. And because of the attractiveness of that data, um, you know, an attacker will find that if stealing an entire database and holding it ransom, that's going to be an attractive target and it will continue to be. And so we're going to see ransomware continue to be a significant threat throughout 2017. Um, CEO, CEO fraud or whaling, um, this is a, a type of uh, spear phishing or uh, email phishing attack uh, where a, a, a fake email gets sent to uh, a CEO or C-level executive requesting uh, money to be transferred to a certain account. They call that whaling uh, in this case. Um, that's also going to become more and more prevalent. We're seeing a lot of it. Uh, from last year, and we're going to see more of this business email compromise, or BEC, uh, to continue to be a major threat to enterprises across the board. And in fact, um, since mid-2015, uh, the uh, business email compromise has actually resulted in roughly $3 billion in losses, uh, according to some recent studies that we, we looked at. And so this is going to be an increasing attack vector um, you know, throughout this year, Again, um, even in the in a lot of these complex attacks uh, will start off with uh, spear phishing or CEO fraud or some type of email-based attack like that. IoT or the Internet of Things, this is also going to be uh, a, an attractive attack vector. So if you look at your IT environment and you think about what do you have that might classify as IoT, well, you might have a smart video conferencing system. Uh, you might have uh, cooling systems that are attached to your Wi-Fi networks to monitor the temperature. You might even have a vending machine in your environment that connects via your wireless network to, um, to essentially monitor inventory and things like that. These are all IoT or Internet of Things devices. And even in your uh, consumer electronics, like in your home, smart, uh, smart TVs, uh, you have uh, smart thermometers, uh, even your... Um, Multimedia entertainment systems in your cars, those classify as IoT devices. Well, you know, a lot of, a lot of individuals uh, don't realize that these IoT devices are actually um, serving as additional attack vectors into your network, into your environment, into your systems. Um, and, and the reason why is because a lot, all of them will have an IP address. If it has an IOP, IP address, then it has the potential to be hacked. Uh, and, and, you know, those are things that, you know, once an attacker gets onto your uh, wireless network, uh, tries different uh, 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 compromises or exploits based on the vulnerabilities that are find, found, uh, they can essentially target the, the IP addresses of those IoT devices to essentially try to take them over. And so think about where IoT devices are in your environment and really kind of um, whether or not they're actually needed or whether or not they can actually be segmented off your, your uh, corporate environment to really kind of put that additional uh, defense layer in, in between. So again, that's going to be another attack vector, another attractive attack vector for these attackers. Medical device hijacking. Um, you know, I think about some of the, the biomed pumps that are out there that are used to dispense, um, dispense uh, prescription drugs based on uh, a patient's um, vital signs that gets monitored. Those types of things are going to get going to get uh, attacked as well. And in fact, we've been we've uh, seen cases and actually have been on engagements where we've attacked those types of uh, wireless networks that that house those devices, those uh, biomed pumps, and have been successful as far as uh, cracking into those uh, those uh, wireless networks and actually getting access to those devices. So they're a real threat for for unauthorized individuals or malicious individuals who really want to cause some harm. Um, you know, you think about the devices that get released out in the market, all the manufacturers are just thinking about how fast they can get it out to the market versus the, the security of the device. And so a lot of the times uh, these medical devices and including these IoT devices, uh, the uh, security of those, those types of uh, equipment are often an afterthought with the manufacturer. And as a result, you know, they're going to uh, remain an attractive target for, for attackers. And here we, uh, we have our second polling question. So I'll turn it back over to you, Emily. Great. And this is our second question of four. Uh, is your organization HIPAA certified? Yes, no, or I'm not sure. 
And as a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. And let's take a look at the results. Okay. Kevin, back to um, you. Okay, thanks, thanks Emily. Um, uh, this is interesting. So uh, roughly half uh, say that uh, the organization is uh, HIPAA certified. And, uh, you know, actually this is a trick question. Um, there is actually no such thing as a, a, a certification, a HIPAA certification for an organization. There's certainly uh, uh, privately uh, issued HIPAA training where you can get certified by that, uh, that vendor. Uh, however, for an organization, there is no HIPAA certification. The Office of Civil Rights for the Department of Health and Human Services does not stamp an organization as HIPAA certified, nor is there any official designation for that that's endorsed by the OCR and, and Department of Health and Human Services. So if, if uh, an organization says they are HIPAA certified, you know, you kind of have to wonder, okay, uh, you know, how, how did they come about with that, uh, that designation? So, Again, that was a trick question. So um, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Troy now. He's going to go over uh, a little bit more detail about uh, high trust and the difference, differences between HIPAA and high trust. And so with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Troy. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Kevin. Appreciate that. So, yeah, as Kevin mentioned, uh, HIPAA really came about with uh, Congress and acted the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act in 96. And then under the administrative simpli uh, simplification provisions, uh, they developed the, the HIPAA uh, security rule. And that was all around the protection of electronic protected health information. So what we, we normally call this uh, EPHI. There's also the, the privacy uh, rule and, and that's all around just um, more, again, around protected health information, but think of it as paper-based, where uh, the security rule is all around uh, electronic information. And with the, the security rule, there's basically three types of safeguards. They're administrative, technical, and physical. And these are all around to address risks associated with the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of this EPHI data. Um, what the security rule doesn't do is it doesn't give you a lot of uh, guidance on what, what you need to do to have in place to protect that data or to determine the, the risks associated with the current controls around that safeguard. That's, a, that's a one thing that we see probably most often um, is uh, organizations trying to figure out well, what what do we need to do for this particular uh, safeguard within the security rule, and, and oftentimes um, you'll see that uh, the security rule will point individuals to um, basically the the National Institute of Standards and Technology, what I'll refer to as NIST, and their special are their uh, special uh, publications that have come out around protecting EPHI. So that's one way to do it. And then as we mentioned, this is not a certifiable framework. It is a regulation. And uh, as Kevin mentioned, we, we really, um, we hear people state that they're HIPAA certified, but that's, that's not really the case. So that's why we bring up the high trust and basically the Health Information Trust Alliance, they developed their common security framework, <coughs> excuse me, their CSF, and that was really to help organizations find a, a, a way to, to protect this information as well as comply with a number of other frameworks or regulations that uh, um, an organization might need to apply. And this is really where um, the high trust CSF has is, is kind of taken off. Is it's a uh, pretty, it's a, it's a very detailed 
uh, framework that provides a kind of a comprehensive and prescriptive as well as scalable framework for an organization to identify risks around their uh, EPHI. And it's built off of multiple security frameworks, and it started off uh, uh, with the with its roots in the ISO 27001, uh, 27002 as uh, the the framework to to build off. And we'll see that in a, a few slides from now. What's good about the high trust uh, certification process? It is a certifiable framework. Um, and people can say, yes, we're high trust certified. And so people can get to, to that level. This is a good example of just some of the, the different requirements and what, what we see the, the difference between the high trust CSF and the HIPAA security rule. So one, one thing to note is that the high trust is updated regularly. Uh, it's currently at version eight. Uh, they've got a new version coming out, uh, fairly soon. And they, they do these, these reviews and updates quite often. And these might be additional controls. Uh, it might be, uh, adding the, their mapping to all the different frameworks that they do, but they do these updates quite often. The controls are also very prescriptive in the high trust CSF. And this is where it makes it a little bit easier for an organization to assess against those. And we'll, we'll see that in, the, in a little bit here. Um, there's also uh, good coverage because you can uh, basically um, apply the high trust CSF uh, to, um, to whatever areas of your business that you want. Maybe it's to your whole organization. Maybe you're uh, a business associate and you have a, an application that handles EPHI. So maybe you're, you're just applying it to that application. So that's the kind of the scalable method that the high trust allows. And it's very detailed. It gives you a lot of information. And um, there's a, a lot of methods to assign your risk based on uh, a number of elements. And this is, this is all the ways that High Trust has built out their, their framework to really be um, an accurate way to evaluate risks within the organization, where the the HIPAA security rule, you're really kind of basing it on, well, I, I kind of understand what that safeguard means, but I'm not real sure what it, what it contains or what I need to document. The, the CSF really gets into more details with that. And like we've mentioned, it does integrate with other compliance requirements. So maybe your organization takes payment cards, so you need to be PCI DSS compliant. Well, there's a mapping within the high trust CSF to PCI. There's also mapping to various NIST special publications, to the CMS, to MARS. You name it, they've probably got a mapping to it. So it's, it's very good in, in that regard. So what does the, the CSF look like? So there's these 14 control categories. And out of these control categories, there's 13 all around security. And then there's one uh, for privacy. In these 14 control categories, there's these 46 control objectives. And out of those 46, then there's 149 control specifications. And these control specifications are, are really where we start to identify what our controls are whenever we're doing an assessment. And then some of these control specifications may have up to three different implementation levels. And so in all, there could be 845 requirement statements if you're going to do a full-blown um, assessment and having to do against 
all of the requirements. That that's just kind of unheard of. But that's that kind of tells you the the number and breadth of the the CSF. And then with each uh, in scope requirement statement that you're assessing against, then you're you're evaluating that based on a certain maturity level. And there'll be a, a five stage process to evaluate where you are uh, with regards to that that requirement statement. And that's how you can go through the the CSF. And for each of those requirements, you're just going to state your your current maturity level is is what it's really after. So the, the CSF, it's made up of uh, what we mentioned, the, the 14 controlled categories. We see that here in the bullet points. And then in the parentheses, we see the, the first number are the, the 46 uh, control objectives, and then the 149 um, requirements. And remember, the, the thing that you don't see here is that under those uh, requirements, there may be up to three different levels that you might need to assess against, and so that's what leads to that 845 number. But the, the main takeaway off of this slide is, is really just um, the, the, the names here. So we got Information Security Management Program, Access Control, Human Resources Security. Those familiar with ISO 27001 these look very familiar to, to that, and all because it's based in, off of ISO. And so we get a lot of the, the same language um, with the CSF as ISO. So that's, that's really good to, to know to um, kind of help uh, understand the, the requirements and the, the CSF as we're, as we're moving along. So a, a high trust security assessment. So this is kind of the, the minimum level assessment that could be done. And what this would, what an organization would do would measure against the 66 implementation requirements, so not all 149, but there's a, a minimum of 66 that are required. And basically, those 66 cover the HIPAA security rule. So everything that you would see in the HIPAA security rule and the, a little bit more is in, the, um, in this high trust security assessment. And what this does is it provides a, a minimum set of requirements for covering the each of the HIPAA security rules. And what's good is that this provides the initial um, kind of compliance assessment. And you could stay at this and just have this kind of self-assessment uh, uh, done, or you could actually move and uh, apply this to certification. If you wanted to go through a certification process, it's always good to kind of go through this uh, readiness self-assessment piece. That way you kind of identify what your risks are as well as your um, corrective action plan. So what are those gaps that uh, may need to be remediated if you want to go through a, a whole certification process? Um, and that certification process would then require a high trust CSF assessor to come in and actually audit those controls. And, and that's where you engage with a, a CSF assessor, come in, they, they evaluate how you've detailed all these answers in the um, CSF tool that high trust has built out and takes a look at the evidence and then they provide that information back to high trust in order to get the certification uh, report. So Emily, I'll pass it over to you for the next question. Thanks, Troy. Our third polling question is, how many control categories does the high trust CSS contain? 
your options are 149, 66, 14, or 46. And for those of you that would like a copy of today's slide deck, you can download them from the icon to the right of your slides. And we will also be sending the slides via email after the webcast. And let's take a look at what everyone has to say. Roy, back okay. to you. So Thank you, Emily. So there are actually 14 controlled categories. So those people that got that one right, and, and it really just is to see who's paying attention, um, but there's 14 control categories, there's 46 control objectives, and a uh, 149 implementation requirements. Um, there are a minimum of 66 implementation requirements assessed for the, for the CSF certification or self-assessment. Um, and that 66, that's, remember, that's the, the minimum set for, uh, um, for the self-assessment and certification. So let's move on to some secure, cybersecurity best practices. And here we've, we've got a uh, or the, the NIST Cybersecurity Framework, so uh, another CSF acronym, but this is Cybersecurity Framework instead of Common Security Framework. So hopefully we don't uh, get uh, mixed up with that. But the, what I want to do is show you the integration with High Trust and the NIST uh, Cybersecurity Framework because the, the cybersecurity framework is a, a really good way to evaluate your maturity level as well as your, your continuous improvement around cybersecurity and protecting assets. And there's a, a number of steps that organizations need to go through in order to evaluate and um, kind of determine what their maturity level is around their, their uh, controls. So first we have to identify, then we have to protect, then we have to detect, respond, and recover. So it's just kind of the, the methodology and processes an organization would go through. And we'll talk about each of these um, uh, pieces and what's called functions within the uh, NIST CSF or cybersecurity framework and we'll, we'll detail what each of these um, functions want to have in place in order to have good cybersecurity and protection of data. Um, the the nice thing about this is that the high trust CSF, they've mapped uh, a number of these compliance frameworks. And so when you're looking at a um, requirement statement in the CSF, in the high trust CSF, then you're able to see, well, how does that map to maybe my compliance structure with PCI, or in this case, high trust, uh, or I'm sorry, NIST um, CSF. And the, the best thing about that is it, it really helps with uh, an organization to kind of assess once and report out on many different compliance frameworks. Since the high trust uh, CSF is, is very, scalable and um, kind of encompasses a, a number of areas that uh, organizations need to uh, abide by. So that's, that's why we want to bring this up because it is a, a good tool, good method to, you know, really take a look at uh, cybersecurity and its best practices. So under the, the first function of NIST, and its cybersecurity framework. It's all around the identification of assets. 
So we really need to know what we need to protect, right? We need to identify those assets. We need to understand our flow of data throughout our organization and understand where, where does that data live? And do we know where it might be um, manipulated in any way and placed in a, a, another, um, whether it's a database or a network file share, that maybe there aren't good controls about around. So, you know, knowing the, the flow of your sensitive data throughout your organization is, is really critical. Then you really need to kind of figure out, well, that data, which pieces of that is truly sensitive? So if we have EPHI, we're going to consider that sensitive data. We don't want that to be leaked uh, at all, right? So we need to understand that the processes, um, who in the business has access to that, and where are they manipulating that data, and where is it going? We also need to know how our service providers or business associates are using this data. What do they have access to? How are they protecting that data? You know, what are, what are their controls and what are we looking at um, from those service providers? What, what types of, uh, whether it's attestation reports in a SOC report, maybe they're high trust certified and uh, you know, certified their, their application, business, whatever they're providing. But how, how are they also ensuring the security of that data? And then kind of lastly under the identify function is performing risk assessments because these are, are really critical to identify the, the threats and vulnerabilities of this data and of these systems. And once we identify those threats and vulnerabilities, then we can apply a risk-based approach to mitigate uh, those risks. And so it's very important to go through these, these steps. The next function was protect. And really, this is probably the, the thing that most organizations do, because we, we secure the data, but um, and there, there's always good controls usually around the systems that we know about. So we, we might know of a, a database that houses EPHI and maybe we actually use encryption and uh, maybe we de-identify the data, uh, maybe we even purge the data when it's no longer needed. Those, usually those controls are pretty good. Um, and the, the protect function is all around that. And some of those really technical and administrative controls to protect this information. The, the other piece with the protect is also providing the security awareness training. Um, and, and what this is, is, is providing training to our staff and helping them understand what does a, a spear phishing email actually look like? As Kevin mentioned, in the types of CEO fraud, the spear phishing, the whaling, that's a big way of getting um, data compromise. So we need to make people aware of the risks and how do they uh, understand what, what that email or, or maybe it's somebody calling over the phone. How people, are, people just need to be aware of the, the various methods um, individuals are trying to get to their information. Then we've got the detect function, and this is probably one area where we see a lot of organizations struggle. So we've got kind of this first bullet point that mentions uh, uh, implementing detection mechanisms. So these are like uh, um, event monitoring solutions. So there's, there's certain controls that we need to have in place to, to allow IT to identify what's going on within their systems. So every system 
will spew out a lot of information, a lot of data. And if somebody was to go through and look at every log on a system, it would be an incredible chore. So we need to have these systems in place to detect and correlate these events that are occurring on our network and within our system in order to provide information to IT, to our security officers, and allowing them to, oh, this might be an incident that's happening. We need to go take a look at it. So there, there just has to be a, a proactive approach to that. Another uh, bullet point here in the DTECT is, is really having these user access reviews. We really need to understand what, uh, what do our users have access to? Is that access truly appropriate for their business need, um, for their day-to-day -day activities? Oftentimes, people are given access to systems for a person that goes out on uh, vacation and uh, that access then doesn't get changed back once that person's back to work. And so then they, they may have access that's not really needed. So we need to take a look at that. Um, malware, very important uh, control. This is, usually this is kind of on the protect as well as detect side. Um, so having an anti-malware solution in place it's important to to have that you know we we've, we've talked about the the ransomware the a malware type of um, software that will you know uh, encrypt files so it's it's important to have these solutions that detect this malicious software and uh, making sure that we've uh, we we're able to catch that and remove it uh, accordingly. The other piece of this is the vulnerability management program, uh, very, very critical, because there, there has to be a way, you know, kind of along with the risk assessment, is how do we know what vulnerabilities uh, exist in our systems, and then how are we ensuring that the patches um, are being applied to those systems to, to eliminate those vulnerabilities. So a, a having a, a program that identifies those, um, you know, maybe there's a, a new software update to your firewall that uh, uh, needs to be applied, and that's something that doesn't get done very easily because um, IT is usually busy applying patches to servers and not necessarily to the firewall, and that may cause uh, an issue in a, a uh, the ability for an attacker to take advantage of that system. So having that program in place that takes a look at those systems and really make sure that they're um, being patched appropriately. So then we've got the, the respond, and this is really having the, the incident response plan. So how do we handle uh, an incident once our detection mechanisms have let us uh, know that there's uh, an issue. Um, so we need to have these plans in place and to really detail out how we're going to respond to, uh, to an incident. People need to be aware of their, their role within this uh, response plan and how are they, what are they actually doing to make sure that uh, the, the incident is being taken care of and managed and that uh, it's contained and mitigated and everything's um, running fine after the, the incident. Um, so this, this is a kind of an important uh, piece to it uh, from the, once we've got the detect mechanism to tell us there's a possible issue, then we have to have the methodology to follow up on that. Then if it gets to the point where we actually need to recover our systems, then we need to have these business continuity and disaster recovery plans. Um, these are plans that help us restore our systems in a timely manner. 
And these, so these are, these are important. And uh, a lot of times we'll see organizations, maybe they don't have anything at all. Maybe they do have something, but it really hasn't been tested. And if you have a plan, you really have to test it to know if it's viable. You don't want to wait until you actually have to recover a system and then figure out, oh, our plan does not, uh, is not up to date, um, doesn't cover what the steps that we actually need to do. So it's important to, to have these updated regularly as well as updated, um, whenever we have new systems, uh, into our environment because then that's usually where the the plan isn't getting updated um, because the these new systems come in we're constantly doing that but these plans don't necessarily get updated as needed so emily turn it back over to you all right we have our fourth and final polling question do you feel your organization has good controls in place to secure protected health information? Your options are yes, no, or I don't know. And once you have completed all CPE requirements, you'll be able to download a PDF of your CPE certificate from the CPE progress window to the left of your slide view. And we'll take a look at the results. Okay, thank you, Emily. So this is this is good to hear. Uh, we've got uh, at least 75% uh, saying that they do have good controls. So that's that's important, and I like to hear that because that's that's good. Um, the seven percent of you that say no, um, we we need to do something. Let's uh, let's let's definitely take a look at that, and especially those people that say that I don't know. Uh, again, knowing what's what types of data you need to protect and ensuring that that data is being protected obviously is, is very important, right? So for our last slide, uh, just some key takeaways. You know, the, probably the biggest thing is that, that we've seen, and as Kevin mentioned, um, the organizations are, are constantly challenged uh, to ensure that the security networks and systems are up to date. And as hackers and attackers continue their um, kind of really uh, pushing our security teams to implement good controls, they, they're usually one leg ahead of us. And so we have to keep up in our security stance. Um, Kevin also mentioned, you know, personal information, protected health information. Those are attractive to, to hackers. Um, we also have to think about our internal employees. And uh, oftentimes we, we get focused on these external attacks, but forget about our internal processes. So having a good um, security posture from the inside will oftentimes see organizations that you know, solid external um, controls uh, through their firewalls and um, intrusion protection systems that then they forget to also they need to harden the, the inside of their network. So we can't make it easy for um, users to get access to data uh, that they shouldn't have access to. So we, we have to protect the, the external as well as the internal. We, we also need to remember to, to take a look at our vendors. So those service providers, business associates that have access to our sensitive data, maybe they have access to our network. Um, so maybe they're a business partner, uh, not just a vendor. But what, what types of access do they have and do we know what, uh, um, what controls that they have in place? How are they protecting this data? Are we giving them access to uh, too much of the data? So always things to kind of think about as we as we go through and, and uh, talk about our, our security controls. Um, the the next thing that I really want to talk about is the, the breaches um, caused by a lack of proper technical 
controls, uh, as well as a lack of user education. So usually breaches come in the form of some sort of uh, spear phishing attack. So that's the kind of the user side. Um, maybe there's no not a good security awareness process there, or there's uh, an issue with the um, uh, a hacker is able to uh, hack into a, a application or a system that is externally facing, and so we don't have good technical controls in place to protect the the systems on the uh, on the network, and so we we have to look at the outside, the inside, and um, what we can do to evaluate that is the high trust CSF. Because it does have a, a good set of controls um, that can be implemented to, to really protect this data. Um, also, as we mentioned, uh, you, you can't be HIPAA certified, but you can be high trust certified. And, and so that's a, an important distinction that, that we wanted to make. So Emily, I'll pass it back to you. Great, thank you, Troy. Looks like we have a few minutes left for some questions. If you would like to submit a question, you can do that in the Q&A window to the left of your slide view. Our first question is, how do I protect my organization from ransomware? Uh, Emily, I'll take that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, ransomware, yeah, that's that's probably the, the worst of uh, attacks these days. Um, certainly, I, I would not wish that upon anybody. But, you know, the, there's certainly technical controls that you can have in place. You know, things like, you know, endpoint protection on your on your uh, workstations and mobile devices. You might have email uh, anti-spam filtering as well as antivirus running on your email server or email gateway. And then you could have like internet content filtering as well. So there's a number of technical controls that you can have in place to protect against ransomware. And this also includes uh, file integrity monitoring systems that you might put on a critical database or, or something like that. Um, however, you know, Troy mentioned it just in the conclusion where, you know, end user or security awareness training, that's really where it all starts is having an educated and uh, security aware uh, workforce. Uh, and if your employees can recognize a potential uh, uh, phishing attack or ransomware attack, uh, and they know how to how to quell that or uh, really kind of um, uh, you know get rid of that uh, uh, email or uh, you know delete that uh, particular email. Um, you know that's really kind of going to be your first defense. So you really it starts with your employee base, making sure that they're aware of these threats, how they can recognize these threats, and really uh, educating them on what they should be doing once they see the threats. But then. You know, it, it really comes down to the human factor. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, we have time for one more. Uh, how does my organization obtain high trust certification? Yeah, I'll go ahead and take that one. So the the process really is you you have to um, engage with high trust. Uh, they they own the the rights to the CSF. And the, the, the first part of it is, is really the, um, I would recommend a self-assessment or what we'd also call a readiness assessment. And this really helps an organization uh, figure out what are their controls and, and what are their gaps and what do they possibly need to, to remediate in order to, to get high trust certified. Um, we talked about the, the various controls and the specifications and requirements, but you do have to get a certain score in order to be considered high trust certified. And so what the readiness assessment does is kind of figure out, well, are you on track there? Could you get that certification? So once you've, once you've done that, you've done that self-assessment, then you would bring in the, the CSF assessor and they would actually do the, the audit against what you've documented in the high trust CSF. And if all looks good, they will turn that information into high trust and 
High Trust then reviews the, the report and the information. And if everything looks good on their end, then they'll, they'll provide the certification uh, to the organization for that system. Great. Thank you, Troy. That's all we have time for for questions today. If you asked a question and we did not have a chance to get to that, we will be happy to follow up with you after the webcast. Thank you, Kevin and Troy, for a great presentation. And as a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts icon to the right of the slide view. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window to the left of the slide view. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. And a copy will be emailed within two weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. Here is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete the survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us today and we hope you'll join us again next time.